paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. From the beginning of our history, humanity has gone through a non-stop change of its worldviews. The funny thing is that all along the way, we're always convinced that now we've got it right. So today, now, in the early 21st century, you'll talk to scientists who will finally admit that yes, it seems to be possible or even likely that there is intelligent life elsewhere in this universe. However, it's supposed to be impossible for them to get here or for us to get there. And really what this is is simply a lack of imagination. I learned long ago never to second guess the relationship with the visitors. It is the most complex, most contradictory, most extraordinary thing that has ever happened to mankind. I don't talk about UFOs. I, I can't stand the term. There are no such things. We've known for years what they are. The government's important because they have the radar systems. They're in a position to connect, collect the data. People in the national security world are dealing with the fact that this is a lie that has gone now for so long. How do you undo such a long-standing series of deceptions? I've met contactees in France, in Italy, in Switzerland. These people are telling stories that are so abnormal they could never make them up. Toby King says, thank you for giving us your children. I remember them putting a needle through my optic nerve, and they were able to put something in the back of my eye. These things are apparently placed in individuals by an advanced intelligence that has a science that's far beyond our own. There was a point uh, like 10 years ago or 12 years ago where I got to see what I call my daughter, which was an extraction of me mingled with their genetics. I think that they may have been using me to produce hybrid offspring from the time of my first menses on throughout uh, young adulthood. We put animals in cages. We take uh, chimpanzees and do medical experiments on them. The justification we use but it's no longer just if somebody else uses it on us. If you're observing the evolution of a planet and you were looking at it as an experiment that you could quantify, you would try to take samples all along the evolution. And they sent a beam that hit me in the chest with three gold balls of energy, which was to restore my memories. That was on a ship that was non-physical. It was more of a plasma ship. What is the effect on a person's life who's had abduction experiences all of their lives? The effects can be profound on people in ways that they don't even fully understand. It's a club that nobody wants to belong to. The secrecy can only be kept so long. It's like a dead body that's been improperly disposed of. At some point, it will rise to the surface. That's the UFO secret. The concept of an alien presence is a part of our contemporary culture, and many people believe extraterrestrials actually exist. Could there be something to this modern myth could an extraterrestrial species really have a hidden hand in shaping the events of our civilization? Is there a scientific explanation for the thousands of eyewitness sightings that occur every year? The hidden hand explores a new paradigm of consciousness taking root within humanity. The Air Force put out the Blue Book on hundreds and hundreds of flying saucer cases. And you look in the Blue Book and it goes about saying, yes, somebody saw something here, but it was swamp gas. Ignore the fact that it was in the middle of the desert. 
They came up to the conclusion, basically, there's no such thing as flying saucers. In December 2007, the Ministry of Defense made a policy decision that it was going to release its entire archive of UFO files. One of the most interesting UFO reports to have been released so far is a first-person account from Major Milton Torres, a retired United States Air Force pilot who, in 1957, was given an order to uh, scramble, to intercept a massive UFO that was being tracked on military radar. The minute I checked in with the GCI site, he told me this is a hot mission that will be firing 24 rockets. And they said, we'd like to inform you that this object is an unidentified flying object. I got my final vector at altitude where I first picked up this huge blip, which is about the size of an aircraft carrier. And then I locked on immediately and I followed it up until about four seconds to go. And that's when it took off and accelerated to something like around Mach 10. The old timers, they were there and presumably involved in the details of the Roswell experience. Only after I'd been to the moon and had become somewhat of a celebrity and came back and they had knowledge of the Roswell incident that they were afraid to talk about because they'd been threatened by authority and they wanted to talk about it and they didn't want to carry their knowledge to the grave. What they said, yes, the Roswell incident was real. It was truly an alien craft. Some that had observed bodies or been a part of that said, yes, there were bodies involved. We went to the Pentagon and eventually we had confirmed that uh, they knew that what we were telling was true. My name is James Penniston. I was the uh, security officer that was in charge of RAF Woodbridge security on the night of December 26, 1980. I did a walk around, paced it off, and measured nine feet by nine feet by nine feet. And then as I came around the far side of the craft, I seen what looked like writing on the side, so I figured it was identifying marks. I was looking for things like, uh, it say, United States Air Force or NASA. And as I got closer to it, I seen that there was pictorials, it was not writing. Then as I touched those glyphs, I was blinded by ones and zeros that was being transmitted. The craft lifted up with no sound, and then took off in a blink of an eye. There are many and various non-human uh, groups and races that are interacting with the Earth and have been all along, you know. I love it when people look out into the night sky and see that blaze of stars and they think they're looking at a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what's in this universe. And they say, do you think we're alone? Are you kidding? I mean, just have another look. En México no existe una persecución del fenómeno. El fenómeno es visto de una manera amistosa. Si este fenómeno aparece en los Estados Unidos o en Europa, los objetos son perseguidos. Sabemos muy bien que esta presencia se incrementó de manera importante a partir de la detonación de las bombas atómicas en Hiroshima y Nagasaki. No, no conozco la agenda de estos seres, pero es muy claro. Los videos son cada vez más espectaculares. Y al mismo tiempo, la situación del mundo es cada vez más grave. Hay una correlación. Entre más grave es la situación, más cerca están.
there is an overwhelming abundance of evidence in terms of documentation showing that there has been an unexplained phenomenon interacting with the militaries of this world for a very long time. That this phenomenon has been taken seriously by uh, the highest level national security people and that they've enveloped the topic in secrecy. Um, they've misrepresented it to the public time and again. It's obvious that there's something important happening here with technology that frankly is not supposed to exist. One of the biggest problems here is secrecy itself because if you can't get access to the information, we tend to fill in the blanks. From my point of view, there is no policy of covering up UFO information or any information about ET. Basically, the government doesn't care. It was on the basis of coming to the conclusion independently and then having it confirmed by someone who had inside knowledge and who would tell me as much as he could without breaking any, uh, any secrets that I decided that uh, the time had come to speak out. And that was when I said that UFOs were as real as the airplanes flying over your head. What is Father Funes doing, who is the chief priest of the Vatican Observatory, comes out in the Osservatore Romano, saying ETs could possibly exist and they are our brothers. Everybody's getting their ducks in a row, including the Vatican, for some kind of disclosure which might be palatable to the world. I was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base outside Las Vegas, Nevada. That is the back door to the highly classified Area 51. I discovered when I was the weather observer that the U.S. Air Force had a base for extraterrestrials. That is the original dreamland. I was a professional soldier and I got an assignment to shape headquarters in Paris, France in 1963. I had a top secret clearance and when I got there it was upgraded to cosmic top secret. World War III was just moments away and these damned UFOs that kept showing up all over the place. We thought they were Soviet, the Soviets for a long time thought they were us. The study in 64 concluding no, it wasn't us, it wasn't them, it was somebody else. Well, the somebody else that they came up with is the thing that really shocked the hell out of the admirals and the generals. That's what opened my eyes to the extraterrestrial reality. People who claim to have been abducted are called abductees. Those who claim to have friendly contact with extraterrestrials are called contactees. Those who choose not to label their experiences as either positive or negative are called experiencers. Are there really people who experience abduction or contact? Are they credible? Are they sane? Are they lying? I was going to see some friends, and there was a shortcut behind our barn. I got to this open field, and I felt as if I was being watched. And I look at these bushes, and this head starts slowly coming up. And suddenly, I felt as if there was someone coming up from behind me. And the next thing I know is that I just kind of pass out on the ground, curled up in a ball, very, very scared. And these little guys in the blue suits were just standing around me. I came to chest deep in weeds. And suddenly I heard my mother calling me. And she wanted to know where I had been. For me initially, it started off with seeing children. They looked just like any ordinary children. And this was at the age of about four or five. But I was also told by them, no one else can see us. I told my mom about it, dad about it, but, oh, it's okay, it's just imaginary friends. And I'm telling them, no, I know the difference. They had helped me with my homework. Imaginary friends can't do that. An entity was leaving 
my bed area and was he was very skinny, tall, and uh, was walking away from me. And he's going toward the wall. And I could, well, who is that? What is he doing? And as soon as I thought that in my head, this entity turns around and looks at me with these large black eyes. It was hearing me say these things in my head. It began to move toward me. I became paralyzed and was terrified in the whole nine yards. It lifted up the covers and stuck its huge bulbous head and large black eyes right next to my face, very close to my eyes, and began to program me. He simply changed my visual thoughts of what he was in my head. He wanted me to imagine him as a clown that was a terrible dream. I started experiencing communications, a lot of telepathic communications at first, where they were speaking to me in my meditations. And one day I asked them who they were, where they were coming from. They said, we're actually coming from a fifth and sixth dimensional experience. And I thought I'd lost it. My imagination is you know, running amok. And, and uh, I said, I'm going up to the garden. I'm going to start digging, planting trees and, and uh, uh, get grounded again. And I didn't even make it to the front door. And my sisters were banging on the door and saying, did you see it? Did you see it? And I said, see what? And they said, the ship. When I got sent to Indian Springs, I was bunking alone in a wooden barracks. And when I got up at night, one of the tall white men had brought in one of the children and they were looking through my stuff. And as I was coming back down the hallway, he was standing there looking at me. I was terrified. I turned around slowly and I was trying to wake up. I was praying and I was saying, please God, let me be sane. I was in my bedroom a week after my father died, and I was saying a prayer. As I finished my prayer, I looked out the window, and I looked at this disc shape, and there was an earthquake, and the house shook. And I tried to run downstairs in my living room. I looked at three of the gray aliens. Then I tried to run back, and. The other gray guy stuck a needle in my back, and I remember being taken inside the craft. Well, one of the most phenomenal aspects of an incredible phenomena uh, is the idea that there is so much control that the uh, UFO occupants have of our memories, of our behavior. Why a person would recall later often has to do with another abduction experience, which is, let's say, slightly more ragged uh, than the earlier ones. And they begin to think about this one, and they look into it. And very often, a person will put all kinds of incredible things out of their mind until they hit the 25 or 35 or 45, and, they th and something happens that day. And they come back with this wound on their leg, and, and somebody saw a UFO leaving the house, and one thing or another, and they think, what's going on here? And they look into that, and that begins to reveal the train of things that led up to that point. For hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people in this world who experience a UFO encounter, this is the most amazing experience probably of their life. And most of these people tell practically nobody about it, all right? We're dealing with this phenomenon in a completely atomized way, isolated from each other, with no broader cooperation and collaboration to deal with this. Claims that the US government has held back information about alien visitors are as old as the purported UFO crash at Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. Some officials in the military believe in the extraterrestrial presence. Why? Is there really a government cover-up? Have enormous sums of money been illegally diverted into black projects? I went to the general one day and it was agreed that we would start no projects in the army on those three items, crop circles, mutilations, and abductions. But we would watch them. We would keep getting the reports because our main objective in those days was weapons of war. We tried to make advanced weapons. 
that maybe we could reach them. But we're never sure that they would fight on our level. And I'm still not sure they'll fight on our level. Why should they if it's a super intellect? Fight us with bombs and cannons? That's not the way they'll fight us. There's a lot of people running around within the national security community who don't seem to have a lot of oversight, but have access to a lot of money. Most famously, this was a statement by Donald Rumsfeld in July of 2001. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. $2.3 trillion in transactions. Where does it go? I think some of it gets siphoned off into black projects. The sound of a craft came up the valley where we were and went no more than about 10 or 15 feet over our heads. There was no downdraft, and when it went by, there was no backdraft. It was traveling, I guess, about two miles an hour, and it went on into a research area out here, uh, part of White Sands. There were six of us out there looking up at this thing, and there was nothing to see. They is Majestic 12, the Committee of the Majority that was formed by Truman in 1947 following the crash at Roswell. And they are the powers that be over the ET technology and the reverse engineering and development of it to the robust state it's purportedly in now, which is starships, U.S. starships. Majestic got together with the Office of Naval Research and got together with Lockheed Skunk Works in the late 40s. They started taking this crash bird and figuring out how it worked. By the end of the 50s, they figured out how it worked. So by the 60s, they were able to replicate the technology in a Model T type style and make it fly. In the book, The Day After Roswell, Colonel Philip Corso really talks about back engineering the Roswell artifacts, that he was in charge of research and development at the Pentagon, where they took the microchip, fiber optics, night screening devices. He was given these things to give huge established companies to back engineer this material. He had huge envelopes of money used to give them. There was no paper trail for what happened. They don't really care if we know that there's aliens out there but they very much care if we absolutely know for sure there's aliens out there because then we know for absolutely sure that there's alternative technology out there and this could endanger their monopolies. And when you step back from the decades of human reporting out of the human abduction syndrome and you parallel that with physical evidence of craft, and you parallel that with the United States' great priority in the Truman administration, was to bring down this disk in order to get the technology into corporations at the most confidential and highly secret level. In the Pentagon are programs known as SAPs, Special Access Projects. Many of these are unacknowledged SAPs, so that means they don't exist. These are dominated not so much by military personnel, but rather by private contractors. At least one of these special access programs is in fact related to the study of extraterrestrial technology and bodies. There was an incident at Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, in which there was a craft, not of this earth, crash. And after we quartered off the area, I was asked to go ahead and move closer to the object that was my first exposure to a craft that was down, complete with bodies. Small nucleus within the U.S. government takes this information, digests it, and does what they call a formalized intelligence product. That formalized intelligence product is then given to customers in the field. I can tell you that we have had contact with entities not of this planet, by all accounts, the hard evidence, the debris, the bodies, whatever could prove the reality of it has all been taken away by the government, who then denies they have anything. 
The Papoose Lake facility is located approximately uh, to the southwest of the Groom Lake facility, which is known popularly as Area 51. The uh, Papoose Lake facility was originally designed as a deep underground base specifically for biodefense applications, biological warfare. Uh, then it was redesigned for back engineering of their devices, including their weapons, their craft, and also for the biological aspects involving the ETs. At S4, there was a large viewing gallery above the area where the clean sphere was located, and the screen was raised, and we were finally told what we were working with. When I first saw him, I was looking uh, through the glass from the gallery. He looked like a bug to me. And we were told at that time that we were um, working with an extraterrestrial. Area 51 itself, of course, did not officially exist until very, very recently. We had drawings of supposedly S-4 underground bases working with aliens and whatnot. But no, no underground bases with aliens. I always say, don't be surprised that strange things fly in the desert. We've got a separate space program totally different from NASA. NASA is building Model T shuttles. The Joint Space Command has become almost an entity unto itself. As Ben Rich said, who uh, ran the skunk works for Lockheed Martin before he retired, he says, we can take E.T. home. And he went to the blackboard and scribbled up there. He says, we've benefited from unfunded opportunities. And they saw it, he says, what the hell do you mean by that? And he went with his chalk and he circled the U and the F and the O. He says, that's where we got most of it. Some psychologists say sleep paralysis is the reason why many people have abduction-like experiences. During sleep paralysis, the sleeper partially awakens, but is almost completely paralyzed and has terrifying hallucinations of ghosts, demons, or aliens. If this theory is true, why are abductions often reported during broad daylight? What kind of technology would it take to remove people from their homes and cars and carry them onto a spacecraft, unbeknownst to the abductees and those around them. The technology is involved with coming here and getting people out of their apartments. And people claim that they go directly through windows, through walls, through, through ceilings and so forth. That's future physics, that's technology. These beings come into the room and take them out and they are under control all the way through from the beginning to the end of the abduction sequence. That is all neurological control from afar. The basic pattern I would say is that persons in a car, there is a craft seen above the car, the car stops, people are paralyzed and quite terrified and two alien figures of three approach the car and take the people out, and they're taken into a craft. They're undressed, put on tables, and there's a series of procedures that take place. When you take a look at a UFO, inside a UFO, everything is for abduction purposes. There isn't anything that we can see that isn't. What we see is room after room with equipment for the abduction purpose, and all that equipment is tailored to humans. That had to be designed. That had to be manufactured. The idea of secrecy, of controlling us, all had to be thought out. This is a program that is multi-layered in the background. They have to have resupply. There's a whole world of abduction activity. We're just seeing the end product. That means that this program is enormously important to the abductors. I think people react to abductions pretty much like any deer in the open would react when we go ahead, tranquilize it, tag it, then go ahead and track it for life. It would have no comprehension, therefore we make no effort to explain to that deer what we're doing. We would have no comprehension as to the total intent 
of what they are trying to do in the abduction scenarios. Abductions and interaction takes place in an altered reality. The phenomena of abductions, uh, for instance, have been going on for millennia. I mean, ever since there's been people, they have had interactions with beings from other dimensions or reported this. I do think that consciousness, at some level, is the core mediator uh, of the phenomena. Now, there's pieces of this that are hardware, and they are picked up by every sensor system that we have. We're talking about a phenomena that, at least for some period of time, is physical. When we talked about the interdimensional capability or possibility that, at times, dimensions cross over. While that occurs, the thing is just as hard as I am sitting here. But when the separation occurs, they go away. And so when you say, where did it go, it's not even a valid question. We tend to think of the UFO abduction experience as something that has only happened in the modern world. It's very common for shamans to experience abduction by beings that they construe as spirits from the spirit world who descend upon the shaman and take him away into the sky. Now, what makes the story of abduction solid to me is that in traveling about the world, you hear approximately the same abduction scenario in Britain as you do in Africa or in the Amazon or Israel. Uh, so the stories are all the same. If there are such things as extraterrestrials, what do they look like? Could they resemble humans? Would we even recognize them as life forms? Will we see these beings as they really are or project familiar earthbound images onto them in a vain attempt to understand their strangeness? By the way, there's not them and us. There's us and them and them and them and them and them. You've got the groups that are psychic and the groups that are not psychic. And within each one of those, you have those that are friendly and those that are unfriendly. The friendly psychic groups are here to help us and they would really like to see us gain more psychic ability. The unfriendly psychic ones want us dead. These short beings with the large head and the black eyes, known as the greys, these are associated with alien abductions in which they're forming various types of medical procedures on men and women. Procedures that have a lot to do with human reproduction. There's two types in my experience. One is the worker being, they're approximately three feet tall. They're the ones with the big heads and the big teardrop eyes. The species of grey that I've been working with that I call the true aliens are about a foot or so taller and their physique is more closer to ours than the, the short ones with the big heads. The most powerful of the gray aliens are the ones who look more sort of insect-like, who are very, very thin, and people describe as praying mantises routinely. Those are the ones that are in control. Those are the ones who are ordered givers. Everybody else is an order taker. The first six years of my abductions were primarily and totally with grays. No emotions, thought-activated technology, totally telepathic, cold and calculated in their behavior. Their minds and the way they can assimilate data, they think 10 to 100 times faster than we do. They have to slow way down to even telepathically communicate. Things that they do seem almost spiritual or they seem like magic. For an example, they have the ability of invisibility. They have the ability to have their working essence maybe 95% in one dimension and 5% in this one. Many abductees not only describe greys, but they describe the blonde, blue-haired people, which they call Nordics. 
these blondes have taken them onto craft, and that on the craft they have taken them out to look at the moon, to go through the solar system. And then you have the reptilians, which a lot of people eschew because they don't even want to consider that something like a reptilian might be running around. That leads into claims that they can shapeshift. Can you imagine what would happen today if you were sitting in a theater and you begin to wonder about the person sitting next to you? I've met so many people who've talked about seeing often people in positions of power, but not always, what they say transform in front of their eyes from a human to a reptilian form and then back again. His, his head was almost human, but this part of his face was a little bit extended. Very broad nose, small eyes, a ridge that slowly came up and went back, little scales, and yellow fading to green coming down the front of his neck. I mean, he looked like a lizard. You also had beings that were almost pure energy, almost like, for lack of a better term, living plasma. There's going to be life that we come in contact with that initially we're not even going to recognize as life. The most uh, uplifting and, and unusual ones up at the upper end of the scale are called beings of light. Many abductees claim they have been implanted with small technological devices. Could these be tracking devices? Could they be a form of mind control? I was approached by an abduction researcher who had a set of x-rays, and in these x-rays there were some uh, foreign bodies which he touted as alien implants, and I thought this was the funniest thing I ever heard of, and turned around and literally walked away. I looked at the x-rays again, and I said, well, these look like leftovers uh, from a previous foot surgery to me. So I simply said, well, when did this uh, person have their surgery done? And he said, well, she never had a surgery done. In August of 1995, we did the first two surgeries for removal of objects. And when the analysis started to come back, it was a surprise to us all from the biology down to the metallurgy. We find that the metal is amorphous. That means that there is no atomic alignment of these crystals. How do you have iron that's amorphous and is still magnetic? The soft tissue, which makes the cocoon that houses the metal, uh, actually this biological tissue grows right into the core of this uh, material. Now there is nothing in medical science, uh, academic science, or even black budget science that uh, can make uh, biological tissue grow into metal. During my first abduction experience in Rogersville, Tennessee, I came away with an implant in my left chin. It was in my leg for 34 years before I had it removed, and it took another 10 years to have it completely analyzed. It was basically silicone. One scientist said it modulated radio frequencies. If you look at it under a microscope, there's actually a pyramid on the tip and what looks like a soundtrack running down one side. Once I had it removed, I started getting sick. We have uh, quite a few cases where people seem to have had implants placed usually in, in the head. And very often, an abductee will remember the alien with an instrument with a tiny little ball on the end, which is inserted in a nostril. It goes way up and hurts. And I have some x-rays of one of these things in place in a little girl. And the neurosurgeon looked at it and said, Bud, that's a piece of metal in there, whatever that thing is. And there's no way it could get pretty much into the head without leaving a hole. We have no idea what these things are for. It could be to implant information. It could be a control device. It could be a monitoring device. It could be something we have yet to think about. Well, I do have an implant 
inside of me, and I believe one is able to send messages back and forth. But I also feel like I have another implant where they're able to not only track me down, but they're able to physically paralyze me. The majority of abductees claim to have undergone genetic experimentation. Why is there so much consistency amongst their reports? Is this an expression of mass hysteria, or is there something really going on? As a child, I had contact at four years old, and all three of them were actually the gray aliens with the big eyes. And they were doing something to me where they were looking at my stomach, my uterus area. This other part, this is kind of hard to talk about, but um, I feel like I was uh, conditioned to be really highly sexual, that there was some kind of clear gel that was put on my genital area when I was just a small child that was extremely arousing. I was awakened by noises. I was in what I perceived to be a tent. There were things in there that seemed like big insects to me. They had an ultra calm female voice that kept saying, what can we do to help you stop screaming? I had a device called an electro simulator thrust into my anus and I had an ejaculation a few moments later. The ejaculate was taken by these beings. I woke up in the morning feeling that something quite terrible had happened during the night. Later that day, I began to suffer pain from the physical injuries I had received. By the time I went to the doctor, and he said, well, Whitley, you've been raped. It took me many, many years to say that. I called it a rectal probe instead, and I ended up being laughed at by every media outlet you can imagine for being raped, and that was a very hard experience. There was a taller being, an insect type of mantis. She looked straight into my eyes, and I saw colors. I felt affection, and I also felt ecstasy. And as she's giving me this mental scan, I was having an orgasm. And then as she's telling me, we're not going to hurt you, then I started feeling pain. They stuck a needle and started removing eggs. I'm in a room with all these females. The being walks in and he looks at me and he says, you will give all these women babies. I freak. I am looking at this container and I say, I like hugging and kissing. And two of the women come over and they start touching me, making those purring sounds. I ejaculate into the container. The sexual stuff was there, but definitely when they extracted semen, but primarily that was what I call uh, screen imaging. To give you an example of what screen imaging is, and I sometimes I feel sorry for some abductees thinking they're having this romantic thing. They create images in your mind when they're extracting semen or ova to lead you to believe you're having this wondrous sexual experience or you're with this very pleasant person. They had gone in with the needle through the belly button and harvested those fetuses. After my hysterectomy, the doctor commented on me having lots of adhesions. What we've discovered is that eggs are taken routinely, eggs and sperm are put together. There's some sort of genetic alteration to the zygote. It is then re-implanted in the female. After nine to 11 weeks, the embryo is removed and it is gestated in a tank. People have claimed that they've had sexual relations with aliens. There are several problems with that. That claim. Number one, aliens do not have uh, genitals as we know them. According to one theory, if there has been ET contact in your family, then every generation that follows will also be involved in the phenomenon. 
What if your daughter said that she was being visited by strange beings at night? Would you believe her? What if your grandmother claimed to have had extraterrestrial contact all her life? Would you commit her? This is a big mystery, what's happening to my family. They are doing genetic experiments. I think it's very strange that two members of the family have, on a regular basis, we're having contact with the alien beings. If you're an abductee, the reason that you're an abductee is because either your mother or your father or both were abductees. And the reason they were abductees was because of their mothers or fathers. And the question then is, well, when did it start? The abduction phenomenon is not just a single event. It also occurs from infancy into old age. They might be abducted 40 times in a year, but not 40 times over the course of their life. 300 times, probably more. Here my grandmother is having this experience. My mother has seen a UFO. <coughs> I'm having abduction experiences. My daughter has seen UFOs. It is clear that many abductees have suffered some form of trauma. Have they been sexually abused? Is that why they invent their abduction experiences as a way to compensate? Or have their actual abductions caused the trauma? When someone comes to me, they're coming to me because they are troubled about some time missing or they can't sleep, they can't function in their daily lives. Why can't I remember the one or two hours? It shouldn't have taken me that long to get home. I'm listening to the radio. I drive out of Albuquerque. A lot of lightning everywhere. It's raining really hard. There's a mile marker 205. Oh, um, that light is not lightning. It's around my car, and there's somebody there in the passenger seat. He's one of the uh, little gray guys. Oh, he's got something in his hand. It looks like a long rod, and he puts it right in. Oh, to my head. That hurts. Oh. oh, I'm not driving anymore. The car is going somewhere. It's not on the road. It's not on the road. It's not on the road. What I've discovered is that when people remember it on their hypnosis, it scares people to death. It is so frightening, it's awful. <laughs> The effects can be profound on people in ways that they don't even fully understand. Sleep deprivation is one. Being afraid to have kids is another one. A lot of the abductees seem to have a lower sense of self-esteem because they are so powerless all the time in these sequences. It's a club that nobody wants to belong to. There were certain things that all of them shared. One was they had uh, a lot of trouble with relationships, of trust. They had a lot of distrust of their own bodies, and they had problems with sexuality. Many people 
have this fear they're never going to see their family again, they're going to be killed, you name it. Now, the trauma remains even though the cause of the trauma may have been blocked by the UFO occupants and the kind of control they have of memory. Yeah, UFO abductees are completely sane. Anybody who argues that the UFO abduction experience is a function of some kind of mental illness have no idea what they're talking about. These are thoroughly grounded people who are having deeply traumatic and unexplained experiences. John Mack, uh, the late professor of psychiatry at Harvard University, concluded whatever we're dealing with here, we're not dealing with some kind of madness. Those individuals may be suffering from something more like post-traumatic shock. Many people experience a spiritual awakening as a result of their extraterrestrial contact. Is this wishful thinking on their part? Or have they really expanded their consciousness? I was up at the school field roughly around 3 a.m. in the morning. I felt a presence show up, an energy that occurred that was so strong that it was amazing. Right behind me was this glowing, misty light. It starts materializing, and now it looks like it's a giant dome on the ground. I noticed that the wind in the field slowed up. I didn't hear it. So I thought, oh, we're having a shift. What I saw materializing in the center were seven light beings roughly seven to eight feet high. So I walked through this energy. I could see their faces. They surrounded me, and then I felt them touch my energy. And with that, they were telling me how I'm not to worry. It was a very amazing feeling of love. The greys would show up, and they were short, little guys, and they were very, very quick and extremely shy. They were almost like birds. If you moved, they would just be gone instantly. There was one that was very old that I would see in the woods, and it was wrinkled. With him, I could ask a question, and the answer would be projected into my mind in the form of a picture. It was never a matter of sitting down and talking, but when you were around them, you would come away with knowledge. My first experience happened in November of 2002. I flipped my car into a lake and drowned with my four-year-old son. During that experience, a being came into the car. And as a being came into the car, my heart opened, my mind cleared, I stopped fighting the water, there was no anxiety, and this being is explaining to me that I have to relax and give myself over, and it's in the surrendering that I will move peacefully to the other side. And I'm thinking, well, this must be dying. I ended up in the sky with six large beings. They were playing a game around a board. They were rolling a die and they were interfering with our planet. And they said, first and foremost, do not judge us. We are both essential to the duality of your planet, the darkness and the lightness. And I saw the side of a beautiful, beautiful face, pure symmetry, pure harmony, just love. They told me that they were going to give me the instructions on how to save my son's life, because my son was in the car with me and he also drowned. And they said, when you go back, remember what we're telling you. And when you get to the hospital, we'll guide you and tell you what to do. So I get to the hospital after the whole accident. And the doctors are telling me, my son is so dead. Please let us unplug him. And these beings come, and they're in my ear now. And they're saying, don't listen to the doctors. Let the doctors do what they do. Let them deal with the human body. And what they want me to do is rebuild the energy body or the etheric body and invite it to stay. And so for three solid days, I rotated hundreds of people through ICU of a major Canadian hospital. And these beings kept coming. We did what they, they told me to do, and on the third day, my son woke up. My heart started beating very fast. And as I'm looking at them, all of a sudden, they just stop. And the frequency of Mount Shasta started changing, almost like an electromagnetic energy. And the next thing I know is I'm on the ship looking through these windows 
and I'm looking down over Mount Shasta. And next to me are these two beings, but they look very robotic. They were almost motionless. And I remember there was sort of like a panel and it was all these blinking blue lights. And in my head, I said, wow, this is really cool. And then next thing I know is I'm back on the ground looking up again. I said, what just happened? And I hear within myself the voice and it said, we needed to bring you back and that's enough right now because we don't want to give you a heart attack. There are what they call low level contacts. And that would be with some of the greys and some of the reptilians. Those groups definitely have an agenda. The higher beings that are coming in right now are putting an end to that just due to the presence of the ultra-dimensionals and the, the more spiritual and technologically advanced beings. In 1973, I had a remarkable experience of seeing what I call a whole light being manifest in a ball of light. This opened my mind to the realization that vast areas of information would be given to the human race, from genetics to cosmology, preparing each of us for a renaissance, a global awakening to the fact that we are cosmic citizens, preparing to experience what I call a new chapter in the Book of Life. In general, I find that reports that uh, maybe we're being attacked by other civilization and so on are not so uh, credible. It's clear to me, even if you look at our own evolution, that in a very short amount of time, a destructive civilization doesn't make it very far. A civilization that reaches higher levels of technology and higher levels of understanding is a civilization that has overcome the tendency to compete and fight, eventually come to understand that it's better to collaborate. That is the attitude that eventually leads a society to higher levels of technologies and eventually to be able to contact other worlds. Many abductees and contactees feel ridiculed and unacknowledged by society. Some of them have formed support groups in order to exchange ideas and experiences. I roll over and there are the three, you know, these three gray beings standing there over me. And I mean, it's immediate. It's immediate terror to, it's as if you know at that moment you have a soul and these beings could eat your soul. It was this haze going around me. And I looked up and I saw the whole block was halfway uh, filled with a ship. And it had these concentric circles under it, all around it like that. The next thing I know, I'm on the ship. Here I was, 12, 13 years old. Coming over the building was this little wobbling circular object. So when I went to school the next day in the schoolyard, I said, last night I saw what is called a flying saucer. Oh, and then they start coming around me. Next day, that happens again. More kids come around, smaller kids. So before we knew it, there were a lot of kids around me. Or have you seen the little green men? Where, what planet are they from? And I said, no. And then I saw another object, which flew out of the sky, stopped like it was a meteor, stopped, slowed down, and gently moved off. And I told them about it. Before I knew it, the principal said, come into my office. You're causing a disruption here. And flying saucers do not exist. And he said, you're suspended from school. The school psychologist instructed my parents to get rid of all my astronomy books, my telescope, and that all had to go into the garbage. And it's, it's best that you get together with your father and learn how to play baseball. So for two months, I was not in school. And so it had a profound impact on my life. When I went to school, I was called the Martian by the kids. I was the weirdo. When I was five years old in 1958, met large, tall aliens in the field. I was called to go there telepathically. A giant star showed up, came overhead, and started lowering itself. I was paralyzed for that moment, kneeling on the grass. I could turn my head and see the beings coming towards me. As one person picked me up, it was about eight feet tall. Telepathically spoke to me. I felt I was part of the family. And from that point on, that's what it's always felt like. My mother told me to go into my sister's room. So as I walk into the room, there are three silhouettes. Then they jumped up as if it's, I scared them because it was like 
he can see us. And they started running around the room very fast. They converged on the window, and their window goes, it turns completely black. And it's like, all of a sudden, I'm looking down a long black hole, and I grab hold to the side of the bed because it feels like if I let go, I'm going to be sucked into that hole behind him, and it just goes back up. And I do what I normally did. After any type of weirdness, I just walk into the kitchen and said, Mother, how come when I walked into Teresa's room, there was little black men in there, and when they ran through the window, the window disappeared and turned all black, and I thought I was going to be sucked through the window. But then I, all of a sudden it went away, and then the window was normal again. And my mother just looked at me, as she always does, and says, that's nice, don't tell your father. Is genetic material really being taken from men and women? If so, should we be concerned about what kind of race might be created from their sperm and ova? I put him in my arms and he continues to cry, crying. I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to do? He says, the, the other one that came in with the little gray guy are some more of my children. And the other. Children are coming up to me. Oh, <laughs> Touching my hand. I think that they may have been using me for to produce hybrid offspring from the time of my first menses on throughout uh, young adulthood and middle adulthood. Whenever I got near a doctor during my fertile childbearing years, they'd ask, are you pregnant? Your uterus is enlarged. There was a hybrid alien uh, who I think fathered all those children. And I would actually have sex with him. And it was almost like having a relationship. It was always him. He was kind of clinical about it. He would stand at the end of the table and go in and do his stuff and then be done. I did feel some emotional quality from him from time to time. And he had those big eyes, but they were very blue and they had a round iris and he had very wispy white hair over a big bald head, similar to the grays, but definitely looking like a hybrid. I don't feel any ill will towards him at all. Um, I feel like maybe he was caught in a situation the same way I was. <laughs> Hybrids would attach themselves at a young age, maybe they'd be 12, to a young abductee, let's just say a young girl who is maybe 10, and stick with that abductee and always be there during abductions into adulthood and continuing on. They would be the ones who the abductee would be having sex with. And I was brought in this room there's this girl standing there, but I believe is about a six-year-old. She had the very rounded head, the very pointy chin, very large eyes, black with a tiny little blue iris, barely a nose, very thin hair. She looked more alien. And they said, this is your child. It was so freaky looking, I turned away. And they quickly like shielded her and took her out of the room past me. And part of me was like, no, wait, it's okay. And the other part of me was like, no, I don't want to meet her. If we do not come through and we self-destruct, they have created hybrid human beings that can repopulate the planet. Then we began to see wholly and totally hybrid controlled abductions without any gray aliens in evidence whatsoever. They are practically human and they are not human. They have the ability to control us neurologically, just like the gray aliens, and we cannot control them. That makes them superior, and it makes us inferior in any kind of settled society. Are secret factions of the military looking to obtain extraterrestrial technology? Are they trying to gain advantage over other nations, or even over the ETs themselves? If these claims are true, have they willingly destroyed our democratic ideals for their own power and gain? 
1998, the most traumatic experience of my life when I had an abduction after my husband called 911. I was told not to talk about it. And I was threatened that I could lose my children and that they would have the Child Protective Service at my house. Human doctors took me in the hospital and they aborted my hybrid child. I was kept in isolation at the hospital until I physically and emotionally got better. These covert ops types, what they're interested in with the, with the alien abductees is alien motives. What do you know about the alien agenda? Why are you being picked up as an abductee? Why are they here? What are they doing? Number two is genetics. What is about you genetically that the aliens are interested in? Number three is the abductee psi abilities. Do you do psychokinesis? Are you able to move objects with your mind? This is common. People are sat at screens, controls. The abductees all report that this technology is all done mentally. The fourth is technology. Have you been shown technology by the aliens? Have you had hands-on? Have you flown or navigated a ship? Have you been shown the propulsion system? Have you been shown any weapons? I was a radar operator who worked on surface air missile and anti-aircraft artillery radar. And when we came to January of 1980, I realized I had no memory of that period of time. With this realization of missing time, I had a wave of nausea and I felt really scared. And what came out was being taken out on the Nevada test site on the electronic warfare range in the middle of the night. We were given fatigues to wear with no rank insignia, no name tags, and we were forbidden to speak to each other on the crew. And there was a saucer-shaped craft. There were about nine of them floating in the sky, but one was really close. It was glowing orange on the bottom. I thought that what I was seeing was way above top secret. We were taken to what I believe was Area 51, to a medical facility there. My name was called. I went into this little room that everybody else had gone into but hadn't come out of. A man in a white lab coat came in and injected me in the side of the neck with a hypodermic needle. And my body started to go into some kind of shock from whatever they injected me with. And I kept trying to hold myself together, so I'd wrap my arms around my knees and laid on the floor of that room. And I was really scared what might happen to me next. There are people who are abducted, who have open contact with both extraterrestrial and multidimensional beings. The government knows of these people. These are the people that they need to make direct communication with our visitors. The only way you can get those people is by finding them within segments of society. You cannot train that in any school. These people, which they call the chosen, the governments want to utilize them. If the extraterrestrial presence is indeed real, how should our governments interact with these beings? How would contact change the religious and political institutions of our society? What could their intentions be? What might they be looking for here on Earth? Could we be in danger? Let's talk about exopolitics. In other words, what kind of relations are we going to have with these people from other planets? I personally am convinced that the United Nations should take exopolitics under its wing so that no national government has an exclusive monopoly on uh, information uh, from and uh, cooperation with visitors from other planets. Well, the impatience with the US by other countries immediately starts to grow from 1991 forward. By the year 2000, we still hadn't had disclosure. And so France issues the Cometa Report, and then a few years later starts releasing its classified UFO files to the world. And then the UK follows. And then Mexico got involved around 2004. Then the Brazilian Air Force decides to cooperate with UFO researchers in Brazil. 
the Russian Navy announced they're going to be releasing a substantial number of classified files. These are basically diplomacy by other means. Disclosure is the wrong way to go. I think what we need right now is to have a situation in which it is permissible, make it okay for scientists to explore these topics without risking their career. If we look for the differences in a sentient beings, then we can justify anything to their captivity, to their torture, to their being killed for purposes of scientific advancement. We never think about them having a social structure or having a personal life. And I really honestly thought that by now, a decade into the 21st century, that the governments would have come clean, that they really finally would have said, we're sorry that we've been keeping this from you, but we wanted to know if it was a threat Hundreds of thousands have already fallen in the bloody conflict between Iran and Iraq. And I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Is it our destiny to go to the stars, to remain successful as a species? Will we become better predators? Or will we learn to love even those creatures who are strange and frightening to us? Perhaps we will reach not only distant galaxies, but explore higher dimensions of reality. The experience of watching the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, and a 360-degree panorama of the heavens appear every two minutes, and being more deep and profound than anything you can see on Earth. It was suddenly an emotional experience of experiencing viscerally a sense of oneness with all that I could see. The amazing thing about this whole adventure we're on Imagine the richness of the information that's present in all of the cultures on our planet. And imagine all these cultures entering the galactic community and every one of these civilizations that reach that level, how much they bring to the galactic community. That is invaluable. So we are reaching that moment, I believe, the human race has got to go to the stars and go out and take our rightful place out there. And that is our destiny. It's a favorable future where this race will endure and survive. We've already got some of the technology to do it. We talk about planets being light years away. Those guys don't live in that kind of a limited world. They have technology that is so far beyond anything we can even imagine. They don't go from here to there. We've already learned that they can warp space in such a way that from here to there is like now. Once you let go of belief systems and you, you start with a blank sheet of paper and you let information and perception and intuition be your guide, your mind starts to open. It's not shutting out alternatives to left brain belief systems. Your mind is allowed to expand. You haven't built a wall around it anymore. And as Einstein said, you cannot solve problems with the same level of consciousness that created them. A new kind of openness and acceptance of the unknown is spreading all through our culture and nobody knows it. The media still thinks in these brain dead cliches good aliens versus bad aliens, when you have lots of ordinary people who are becoming hyperdimensional beings very quietly in their own living rooms, when this kind of change comes to the human mind, there's always the same disconnect. 
the people in power get left behind. I believe we as the human race are headed not for destruction but for renaissance. Clearly our visitors from other worlds have different energy forms of travel hyperspace reality, hyperspace technology, physics of which we can begin to work with if we do make valuable contact with these other worlds count. People are getting inspired, and I see that as messages for us to change as a race, but maybe this generation can't handle it. So logically, who's going to be changing are the children, the new generation of the future. And with the proper education, I do see changing of a race. I see that they could probably handle contact a lot better than our generation. Since the much-publicized saucer crash at Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, our cultural openness to contact with extraterrestrial life has grown exponentially. Is there really life on other planets? Tonight we have never before seen videotape of UFOs over Colorado. Stories of extraterrestrial contact are portrayed in the media with increasing frequency. Is this because we are embracing a true planetary phenomenon? Or are we being conditioned into believing mass media UFO hype? Are the sources in the sky secret military craft or ships from other dimensions? Are we being programmed by the media to view aliens as a common enemy so the need for war will never cease? Are ETs spiritually advanced beings concerned with the fate of humanity? Or are they the demons that have plagued us since the beginning of time? If a hybrid race is being created, what does this mean for humanity? Are we being replaced like a tired breed of plow horse? Or is this a foreshadowing of the kinds of creatures our scientists will soon create in our own labs? The answers to these questions are not easy to find. Neither the secret government nor the ETs are forthcoming. So much is shrouded behind veils of national security. At some point, the secrecy will be lifted. At some point, this will all come to light.